Welcome to the Church of England's national online service. We're here today at the parish of St Hillier. We are two churches, Bishop Andrews and St Peter's here. Why don't you come and join us for today's service? As well as a parish church, we're also a church army centre of mission. And the vision of church army is for everyone everywhere to encounter God's love and be empowered to transform their community through faith shared in words and action. There are several church army centres of mission across England, Scotland, Ireland and Wales. And church army centres of mission create ways to work in local communities. They seek to bring the faith of Jesus Christ to all. Centres of mission usually work in estates where existing models of church have struggled. The centres of mission are in partnership with local churches and dioceses and they create new churches for the unchurched. Church Army Centres of Mission create food banks, work with people with addiction, start recovery courses, create churches for young people in school, faith groups, discovering faith groups, and many other ways they faithfully serve their local community. And every centre of mission is different, and they all work alongside the local church. The centre of mission here, the St Hillier Centre of Mission, doesn't work alongside the church, it is the church. We go hand in hand. We cannot differentiate between the centre of mission and the parish church. We are one. I am the lead evangelist for the centre of mission, but also the vicar of both churches. So we work as one. Much of our work here is outside of the church building, joining in with community initiatives across the parish. But we also use our building for outreach projects that we have here, such as a community choir, a community cafe, an art for wellbeing class, a youth club, discipleship groups. We run regular alpha courses. Our discipleship group is currently engaged in the Diocese of Suffolk new Magnify course. The Magnify course is designed to be the course that reaches the parts that other courses do not reach. No previous qualifications or education or achievements are necessary. The Magnify course will enable and empower the people of this estate to confidently share their faith in Jesus. Welcome to the St Hillier Centre of Mission. Welcome to the Church of England's weekly online service. God created all things in heaven and earth. I greet you in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Each week before our service begins here, we think and pray about those for whom do not have the freedom to worship in the way we do. We pray for our persecuted family. And at the moment, we're using the open doors world watch list for this year. This morning we pray for Nigeria. Nigeria are number six on the list and yet it is the most dangerous place to be a Christian in the world. Let's pray for Nigeria. Loving God, we thank you for brothers and sisters in Nigeria. We thank you for their commitment to the gospel. We ask that you would empower and embolden them to sh continue to share their faith. We stand with them shoulder to shoulder, ask that you strengthen and uphold them and make your face to shine upon them. In Jesus' name, amen. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Christ, by his Spirit, has brought us out of darkness. To live in his marvellous light. We stand before the throne of God with countless crowd from every nation and race, tribe and language declaring. Salvation belongs to our God. A collect for justice and equality. Compassionate God, who sent Jesus Christ to deliver us from all manner of injustices and inequalities. Create in us new hearts and enlarged visions to see the image of God in every person, irrespective of background, race and ethnicity. 
may we be generous in our love of others as we work towards ending misunderstanding, racism and injustice, creating communities of human flourishing. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We come to God as one from whom no secrets are hidden to ask for his forgiveness and peace. God of mercy, we acknowledge that we are all sinners. We turn from the wrong that we have thought and said and done and are mindful of all that we have failed to do. May the God of love and power forgive you and free you from your sins, heal and strengthen you by his spirit and raise you to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. In the freedom of forgiveness, let's stand and praise the Lord. King of kings, majesty, God of heaven living in me, gentle Saviour, closest friend, strong deliverer, beginning. The reading today is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 17 to 31. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answers. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle 
than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Then Peter spoke up, We have left everything to follow you. Truly, I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields, along with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Loving God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the words you have laid on Haley's heart for us today. May our ears be ready to listen and our hearts be ready to receive what you might be saying to us this morning. In Jesus' name. In the Gospel reading we've heard today, Mark tells us that Jesus has set out on a journey. A reminder at this point that Jesus is headed to Jerusalem and to the cross. He's not long set off when he is interrupted. We find the story of this man told in three of the four Gospels. Mark describes the man with great wealth. Luke says he's a ruler and very wealthy. And Matthew tells us that he was young which is why in some versions of our Bible, we have the head in the rich young ruler. The Gospel of Mark is pretty fast paced. And up, up to this point, we've heard about Jesus inviting two sets of fishermen and a tax collector to follow him. Mark uses phrases um, like this, immediately they left their nets and followed him. And immediately they left their father in a boat and followed him. Jesus called the tax collector and he got up and followed him. Mark uses the word immediately more than 20 times in this gospel. In addition, we hear people are astounded and amazed at Jesus's teachings and miracles. But then we come to this story, and amazed, astounded, and immediately are nowhere to be seen. No, instead, Mark tells us that the young man is left shocked and grieving, his face fell. And when the disciples consider what this means, they're perplexed, shocked, grieving, and perplexed. I don't know what you feel about this young ruler. Do you think him foolish? Like me, do you find the story a bit sad? We don't know how it turned out for him. Did he just leave sad with all his wealth and power? Well, this story got me thinking. It got me thinking about treasure and I asked a few people around activities in the parish, what do you treasure? Here's what they said. Good health and family. Um, family photos. Yes, every single generation is pictured together. I treasure my family, uh, my job, um, yeah, just quality time with the people I love. My family, my family, because without them, I wouldn't be here today. Good health and love. I treasure my children. I treasure my family. I love my family, all of my family. I think in particular, I treasure my daughter. My, my daughter is just six months old. So good health, family, family photos. Sentimental keepsakes, jobs, careers, good health, love, children. How would you respond? How would your answer be similar? Perhaps an expensive item or something that holds sentimental value. What if I worded the question slightly differently? What couldn't you live without? In biblical times, the most important thing to people was home, land and familial relationships. So not too dissimilar to us then and from what, some of the responses that we just heard. I asked the, the same people, how would you feel if you had to give all of that up? I think I would give up. 
because they are my life. Unhappy, sad, miserable. I've lost one of my treasures two years ago. I couldn't bear to lose the others. Uh, for me, I, that would be heartbreaking. I'd find that really, really hard. I don't think I'd be able to do it. Um, I think I'd try to do with my memory, but it's not the same as anyone who's just looking at them and thinking maybe you're going to have a mental affair at some point. I'll cry. I'll be really, really sad. If that, if that is taken away from me, I'll be really, really sad and depressed. I think I would feel devastated if I have to give up my my family. They they mean so much to me. They are a great support to me. Um, and I just love them. I love them dearly. Even when they drive me mad, I love them. Sad, depressed, I don't think I could do it. I'd feel like giving up. Those were the responses that we just heard. So how do we feel about the rich young ruler now? Could we relate to him a bit? Maybe not being rich or young or a ruler, but maybe in some way we can identify with him and understand how we might be feeling. Maybe in some ways we are him. I mean, perhaps this young ruler's got a bit of bad press. We know he's run up to Jesus, he's knelt before him, he's super keen. What must I do, he says, to inherit eternal life? He calls Jesus good teacher, to which Jesus replied, only God is good. Maybe this young ruler has some insight about who Jesus really is. He asks, what do I need to inherit eternal life? Perhaps because of his wealth and riches and power, he's always been able to do something himself about getting what he wants. Here, though, he's not asking about how do I get to heaven. Theologian N.T. Wright says that the phrase eternal life or kingdom of heaven doesn't mean that. It means God's sovereign saving rule coming to transform everything coming to bring the whole creation into a new state of being, a new life in which evil, decay, and death itself will be done away with. Perhaps, he suggests, what this young man and many others at the time were asking was who will inherit eternal life and the age to come. The standard answers were normally keep, keep the Jewish laws, the Ten Commandments, which he said, I do that, I do it, I'm good. I follow the rules, tick. It's fairly well acknowledged that in polite conversations, it's not the done thing to talk about money. Money, politics, and religion. However, Jesus does talk about money. Jesus doesn't shy away from this, and he cuts to the heart of the matter. Professor Dawn Atoni Wilhelm, in her book on Mark's Gospel, tells us that no other topic occupies Jesus' preaching and teaching more than wealth and material resources. Of the 38 parables in the New Testament, 17 pertain to possessions and giving. Over 2,100 verses touch on the subject, more than believing and prayer. So, more than right beliefs, Jesus is concerned with the right use of resources as we learn to care for the needs of neighbours near and far. In the video interviews, we hardly heard anyone talk about possessions or wealth. Like no one said, I treasure my Mercedes car, or I treasure my Rolex watch. And yet, in the case of this young man, we do know he had great possessions. The passage is about possessions and wealth. It's also about treasure and discipleship. And by discipleship, I mean what it means to follow the way of Jesus, what it costs. And Jesus says that, doesn't he? When Peter looks at him and says, Lord, we've left everything and followed you. And they had careers, family, friends, livelihood. Jesus talks about the rewards. Truly, I tell you, there is no one who has left houses or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses and brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields with persecutions. He doesn't leave that out. The way of Jesus is the way of the cross. It's a sacrificial life. Today, 
like the start of all our services here in the parish of St. Hillier, we prayed for the persecuted church, for our sisters and brothers from nations where it's dangerous to believe in Jesus, where owning a Bible could get you thrown into jail or worse, killed. They know the cost of following Jesus. I've been reading about some young men and women who left ordinary lives to take vows and enter monastic communities. They became nuns and monks, and I was so struck by what they gave up. Even their birth name, even the name that their mothers and fathers gave to them in order to follow Jesus. Consider that. I have friends who left to serve God and people with various missionary organizations around the world. I watched as they gave up homes, friends, families, careers, their homelands, and all that was familiar. It had a significant impact on me to watch them, so much so that later I would pray in my own life, God, wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do, I will go for you. I remember too, utterly amazed that God would give them family and friends and homes. I've seen them travel the world far and wide and receive hospitality from new friends and family all around the world because of Jesus. So what does this story then tell us about the human condition and our posture? I don't know if you're like me, but when I have a good thing, I want to hold on to it tightly. I don't want to let it go. I'm like a kid with a hand in a sweet jar. I grab the sweets, but I can't get my hand out because I've grabbed loads and I'm holding it tightly. We have a desire for more and to hold on to good things. But maybe this story is teaching us actually that sometimes the things we possess can sometimes have a way of possessing us. They become idols in our life and can prevent us loving God with all our heart, soul, mind and strength. I think this passage is about our posture. Those of us who want to follow Jesus need to travel lightly with open hands, thanking God for what he's given us and dedicating it all back to him. It's all yours, Lord, anyway, even my own life. And when we have hands like this, perhaps it gives us room for Jesus to put in other things like homes and families and brothers and children. What things are you holding on to that might be stopping you? Maybe a career, reputation, family commitments. Or what things might have been possessing you, possessing us, like addictions? We all have something in our lives. It may be material possessions. It's up to each of us to examine our hearts and our lives to see what is holding us back from serving God with completeness that Jesus longs for. Interestingly, prior to this interruption, Jesus was telling his disciples the way to receive the kingdom is to receive it like a little child. A child comes with nothing in their hands. Well, might be a bit dirty and a bit sticky, but they come with nothing to offer. They come completely trusting and dependent on their caregiver. Are we like that with Jesus? You might be thinking now, oh gosh, what do I need to do? What do I need to give up in order to follow Jesus? And the whole point is that you can't. You can't do it through human endeavors. You can't do it in your own strength. You might have tried and fouled in the past, but actually it's the Holy Spirit who convicts and then gives us power to respond. And lastly, what can we learn about Jesus here? Jesus is always wanting to liberate, always wanting to set people free. Jesus, looking at the man, loves him and invites him. He invites him to go, sell, give, come, follow. But he's not pushy and won't force people. Notice how he doesn't run after him and try and convince him to change his mind. He looks on him with love and lets him go. It's his choice to make. So perhaps during this next song, you might want to examine your own heart and think about Jesus' invitation to you. How might Jesus want to liberate and set you free?
And how do you respond? What posture might you take today? Let's declare our faith together. Do you believe and trust in God the Father, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Son, who took our human nature, died for us and rose again? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God, the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world? We believe and trust in him. This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Father God Almighty, loving Creator, thank you for getting us here safely today. We have come here to honour and worship you, giving you all the reverence and respect that belongs to you and you alone. Lord Jesus, you are a living hope. Thank you, Lord, that you never give up on us. Let us never give up on you and the plans you have for the St Hilary Estate. 
We ask that you continue to fill our leaders at St Peter's and Bishop Andrews with a vision you have to restore and transform this estate and the local community. Lord, many of the street roads in this estate have been named after famous national church landmarks. By the power of your Holy Spirit, we ask that the vision on which this estate was originally founded will grow and flourish to become the place where your love and life-giving spirit are clearly seen. Lord, let this, be a state, this estate serve as a model of peace where different communities live in unity and harmony. Thank you that there is transformation already happening here. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of your plans for this place. Lord, in this month when we remember black history, we celebrate all the positive contributions made and that continue to be made by people of color. May black history not be just something we do on the calendar once a year, but something that's part of our daily lives. We ask for forgiveness and healing for past wrongs, as well as justice and restitution. God, you are an inclusive God, and you have called people from all nations, tribes and tongues into your family and your kingdom. Your word says that in your kingdom there is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave or free, male or female. We are all one in Christ Jesus. We thank you for the many, many ways that our lives are enriched by living in multiracial, multicultural society. May we celebrate our differences and use them as an opportunity to respectfully learn from each other. Thank you for all the positive contributions that people of color have made to this country and the world, which are often so unrecognized, discounted, or covered up. Lord, sadly remember that slavery still exists today. We pray to support systems and organizations that fight for freedom and the human rights of all people. May we as individuals take direct action in, to fight slavery, oppression, persecution, and injustice of all kinds. May we remember that you love each and every one of us and that we're all precious and equal in your sight. Lord, we pray for those who are sick in body, mind, and spirit, and in this time of silence, we bring them to you in prayer. Lord Jesus, our Prince of Peace, we pray for all countries and places in the world that have been affected by war, conflict and natural disasters. We pray for those who have lost loved ones. Lord, our heart goes out to them. And we ask, dear Lord, that you being the God of comfort, you will meet them at their point of need and shower them with your supernatural comfort as they mourn. May they be surrounded by people who can support them in their time of sorrow. Remember also the sick and injured, asking not only for physical healing, but also mental and spiritual healing. We pray that you will reach them too at their point of need. We ask for your provision for all those who have been displaced and without food, shelter or sanitation, as these people rebuild their lives, continue to fill them with hope, Lord. Thank you for the courage for all those who care and support people facing adversity, many of whom risk their own lives in so doing. Lord God, we pray for our political leaders, MPs, councillors, and all those who are in positions to influence political change, including your church. Grant them courage and wisdom to make sound decisions and to take right action. Bless them with perseverance in their efforts to establish and promote the welfare of all humanity. We ask that they may carry out their role with humility, love and compassion, which are just some of the qualities that you showed while you were here on earth. And God of all creation, we are grateful for the open spaces that we have on this estate and surrounding it. And we thank you for the beauty of your nature. And as we enjoy what we see, let us remember your instruction to look after our world. We also lift up anything that we've left out, Lord, as your word tells us you already know what we need. So thank you, Father, for listening and hearing our prayers. And we pray these in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. And let's um, sum up these prayers in the words our Lord Jesus taught us by the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. 
Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. In Christ alone my hope is found He is my light, my strength, my song This cornerstone, this solid ground Firm through the fiercest droughts and storm What heights of love, what depths of peace When fears are stilled, when striving cease my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slay, then bursting forth. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us this day and always. Amen. <laughs>